Harper's book. And this time we're talking about a book, Embracing Diversity. Oh, that's a good one. Okay, we are going to begin, and whoever enters will be welcome as well. But uh, welcome to the continuation of our study and conversation on living out our baptism as God wants us to. And I am so overjoyed to introduce you to the Reverend Paul Hoffman, who has become for myself um, and for Elizabeth a real gift in helping us form um, not just our own our thoughts for the living faith experience, but for our own personal experiences as well. Um, Pastor Hoffman is uh, graciously meeting with us today from. Uh, I cannot pronounce your hometown. What it be killed? What? How do you say that? Uh -oh. Uh -oh. No, so you have a first technical problem. Michael Teo. Michael Teo. Okay, in Washington State, which means this friend of ours has been up for some time. Oh my uh, God! In the early hours. <laughs> um, but he is also a Pennsylvanian by birth. Uh, in York, Pennsylvania, attended uh, Lycoming College, graduated from Gettysburg Seminary when it was by itself. Now, of course, it's combined with Philadelphia Seminary. Um, and went on to, as what you call, call a churchless uh, area of Washington State, founded a congregation, Finney Ridge, that became vibrant, full of health and um, <clears throat> Good, good Christian action and word, and author of two books of which I have read, Faith on Faith and uh, Faith Shaping Ministry. And he is very much responsible for Elizabeth and I for what we have done uh, with baptism and what, how we will continue to use it throughout the coming weeks and days and years. So with that, my friend, there you go. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God, we give thanks to you for the gift of our baptisms, for our dying and rising with Christ. Help us die to sin each day and rise to new life that united with the body of Christ, we may serve our neighbor and bring glory to you through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, good morning and thanks for this uh, wonderful invitation to be with you electronically in uh, Ambler, Pennsylvania. Lovely to be back home <laughs> for a few minutes this morning. Um, I always feel like uh, I'm a different person if I know what's coming. I live through my day differently if I know it's uh, spaghetti and meatballs for supper rather than liver and onions. Um, <laughs> so I thought it might be helpful for you to know uh, where we're going in these two sessions. Um, today, I'm going to kind of give you uh, my take uh, on a, sort of a theological and scriptural overview of how I think um, we've come to understand baptism in uh, our current context in 2022 in North America. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> next week, um, we'll try to take a look at how that um, understanding, both theologically and biblically, has affected um, um, how how we've been formed um, by our baptisms. Um, so today's, I don't know, fortunately or unfortunately, going to be a lot of me talking. Um, if, as I'm talking, if you have any like clarification questions, please feel free to interrupt. Like I just, I didn't hear that. I didn't get it. I need to hear more about that. Um, but let's save the broader discussion questions for towards the end of our session together today. Um, so um, I just want you to get this 
pattern into your head. Um, we, we most frequently talk about our faith um, and how we cherish it as a matter of life or death. Um, it's, it's that important to us, right? Uh, you wouldn't be an adult, at an adult forum if it didn't mean a great deal to you. So it's, it's a life or death issue. Um, I want to see if I can get you to flip that <laughs> in these two weeks so that you think about life in Christ not as an issue of life or death, um, but an issue of death and life. <clears throat> so just flipping those two little words around in my mind makes all the difference in the world. And, and that is to say in a, a different kind of way that our baptism is all about dying and rising. It all begins with a death. In baptism, we are united with Christ in his death so that we might be raised with Christ into a new life. And I know that you've looked at this scripture in the past two weeks together, but we can't hear it often enough. This is Romans 6, 5, and this is the core of our Lutheran baptismal understanding. Mm -hmm. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. And, and there it is, dying and rising. United with him in a death, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection. I'm going to read you a little story, um, which is probably the single most um, transformational story in my baptismal journey and in my understanding of this whole idea of dying and rising. This is from a book by John Westerhoff called Bringing Up Children in the Christian Faith. And uh, this is how he begins. Once I witnessed a baptism in a small church in a Latin American village. The community of faith had gathered. They had recalled God's gracious acts. They had proclaimed the gospel. And now they were about to make a response. The congregation began the mournful sounds of a funeral hymn as a solemn procession moved down the aisle. A father carried a child's coffin he had made from wood. A priest carried their sleeping infant wrapped only in a native blanket. And the priest, excuse me, as they reached the chancel, the father placed the coffin on the altar, the mother poured the water into the coffin, and the priest covered the waking baby's skin with embalming oil. The singing softened to a whisper. The priest slowly lowered the infant into the coffin and immersed the child's head in the water. As he did so, he proclaimed, I drown you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen, shouted the parents in the congregation. Then quickly lifting the child into the air for all to see, the priest declared, and I resurrect you that you might love and serve the Lord. Immediately the congregation broke into a joyous Easter hymn, but it was not yet over. The priest covered the child with the oils of birth. He dressed the child in a beautiful homemade white robe. Once again, the singing quieted as the priest anointing the child made the sign of the cross on the child's forehead and said, I brand you with the sign of Christ so that you and the world will always know who you are 
and to whom you belong. As the singing continued, the people came forward to share the kiss of peace with the newest member of their family. What more brave, radical act can parents perform than to bring their child to the church to be baptized? I sometimes wonder if we would bring our children to the church to be baptized if we fully understood the implications either for them or for us. Baptism is more than a momentary rite. It is entrance into a lifelong journey, a lifelong quest to live out the implications of this new inheritance. Baptism not only starts us on the way of faith, but it signifies to the whole world that we are among the company of those who are signed, sealed, owned, claimed, and commissioned to do Christ's work in the world. It is no mere individualized experience. We are not simply incorporated into a set of good intentions or new feelings. We are born into the family of God. Well, that's a pretty, at least in my, <laughs> to my ears, a pretty powerful story um, about one particular baptism. Um, I think it's quite different from the way most Lutheran congregations um, celebrate baptisms. Yes. And, and, <laughs> and uh, perhaps in that difference, we lose some of the impact of this idea of dying and rising. Uh, Luther really embraced this idea of dying and rising in our baptism. And as is so often the case with Luther, he tipped the diamond just a little bit so that we can understand it in an even deeper way. And the way that he tipped this particular diamond was to say that um, we don't just die once in our baptism and we're not just raised once in our baptism, but as um, people of God who are baptized, we are involved in something called a daily dying and rising. Um, so even though Lutherans have let the evangelicals co-opt uh, the language of being born again, Luther would say that we aren't simply born again, but that as Lutheran Christians, we are born again and 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 again every day of our lives. And if, if you just, if you think about that just a little bit, um, and, and remember that in the Jewish pattern of life, um, days don't go morning and evening, they go evening and morning. <laughs> so you have every day a dying when you go to bed at night. Our, our sleep is like a little death. And Luther says that every morning we should rise, make the sign of the cross, remember our baptism, and be born again. So there it is again, that pattern, dying and rising, right? Dying and rising, dying and rising. Um, each and every day um, of, of our lives. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about this more next week, but I, I, I don't believe that the way we currently practice the sacrament of baptism 
that we are exploiting as fully as we might that rich theology of of dying and rising. Um, I think we're a little heavy on the rising part. (laughs) And uh, we're particular, excuse me, just a second. We're particularly heavy on the um, rising to new and eternal life part. Um, But we don't talk about um, what it is that um, our baptism is asking us to put to death. Just just sit with that uh, for a little bit. I'm I'm going to do a, a a quick like retro <laughs> to um, to the Red Sea. Um, so back about the uh, thirty two hundred and fifty years in our faith history to the Red Sea. And um, that is the, the primordial or the, the initiating event for this pattern in Jewish and then later Christian life of this passage from death to life. Um, in in Greek, the word pascha, P-A-S-C-H-A, means passage. And um, <clears throat> Bill was talking uh, earlier about a picture that he has on his phone of the font that he was baptized in in Battle Creek, Michigan. And uh, he he mentioned kind of in passing that the font is framed by a candle on one side and the cross on the other. And I'm sure that you have a candle by your font there at Upper Dublin Lutheran Church. And does anybody know what that candle is called? Yeah, it's a baptismal candle, but it does have another name. Yes, it's a Paschal candle. It's a Paschal candle. And it gets its name from that Greek word, Pascha, which means passage. Mm -hmm. So think about the Red Sea story, like go back to Exodus 14 and 15 in your biblical brains Mm -hmm. and think about how um, the writer talks about a pillar of cloud and fire. And, And what is a candle, a Paschal candle, except a pillar of cloud and fire. So it is what leads the way through this passage from death to life. Imagine the Hebrew people coming out of Egypt and being told by Moses that they're going to step into the Red Sea. I mean, that's like an invitation to do what? To die, to drown, to step into their death. But what lay on the other side for them was a new life characterized, first of all, by 40 years wandering in the wilderness, but then by the freedom of the promised land. So in in the Red Sea event, you have all of these... um, seeds, all of these beginning moments of different ways of thinking about Pascha or passage. They pass from slavery into freedom. They pass from death into life. We have broadened that in our baptismal theology to say that we um, pass from sin into forgiveness and that we pass from living for ourselves to living for others. Maybe that's the toughest passage of all, (laughs) to think about how we can die to our own self in order to be raised up by God 
to live for others. And, and I know you talked about this last week, the, the importance of living out your baptismal covenant, not just um, taking it in as something that you receive um, through which you are given um, entrance into the kingdom of God and the gift of eternal life. But you're also um, on the other side of the coin asked now to live as a citizen of the new creation as one who is assured promised entered into the covenant of new life so that you can be freed to take risks on the part of others and um i i just want to say one more thing about that Paschal candle, um, doesn't it itself embody death and life? If if you look at your Paschal candle unlit, it's just dead. <laughs> but when it's lighted, it brings um, life and light to all who see it and to all who um, pass beneath it. Um, I, th I think we could benefit as Lutheran Christians from thinking about our baptismal fonts as miniature red seas, hmm. that every Lutheran church has a red sea in it, <laughs> and that it is uh, the new Christians passage of all those ways that I just mentioned, slavery to freedom, death to life, sin to forgiveness, living for self to living for others. It's, it's the passage through. There's, there's one small rubric um, in the baptismal liturgy, a moment at which when the pastor is praying over the waters, they take their hand and they make the sign of the cross with the words in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that that rubric indicates, but most people don't know about or think about, is that it is, it is, a, it is an echo of Moses stretching his hand out over the waters of the Red Sea and parting them. We part them in the name of Jesus with the sign of the cross. Moses parted them in the name of God so that there could be a Pascha for his people. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to stop there. <laughs> that is uh, uh, two semesters worth <laughs> of baptismal theology. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm sure you have some questions um, or, or reflections. How does that how does that all land with you? Okay, I uh, I'm sure we have a lot of questions here, but um, why do you suppose uh, in our Lutheran lives <laughs> that we have given so little thought to our baptism? And I am an example of that and focus so strongly on our other sacrament, the Eucharist, our Holy Communion. Um, I mean, what you just shared is so new for me to hear, yeah. which I love. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, you take communion every week, you know, and you're baptized once. So <laughs> that would be one reason why you <clears throat> communion and baptism yeah um the, the christian church always exists within a larger context right we we always live within a culture and um as you heard through the opening story um this little Latin American village where Westerhoff observed this 
dramatic <clears throat> dying and rising in baptism is likely a culture that faces uh, death on a daily basis. <clears throat> um, in Western culture, we have become um, almost allergic to any conversation at all about death. And I have to tell you, out here on the West Coast, it's like 10 times worse than it is in Pennsylvania. Um, the funeral practices out here are just amazing to me. It took me a really, really long time to, um, to get used to it. In almost 20 years of parish ministry, and you know, hundreds of funerals. I think I had a body in the church maybe six times. <clears throat> um, almost always a memorial service, sometimes with cremains, most times not. But we, we've become so allergic to, to dealing with death and to recognizing death as a part of life, that it makes a lot of sense to me that we would also sublimate that whole idea of dying and rising in our baptisms as well. So it's a lot about rising. It's a lot about um, beauty and joy and grace and white and light and everlasting life. Um, it's even pretty light, I think, on Christian responsibility that comes with baptism. And it's certainly light on the whole idea that um, today, first in, in a baptism, first of all, we're going to have a crucifixion. And then we're going to have a resurrection. And uh, my guess is that hits some of you like pretty harsh, like, Ugh, I don't like the way this pastor talks, <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's the reality of um, what our baptism is and what it means. I, I've, since I left parish ministry in 2013, I've done a lot of mentoring with mm -hmm. the newly ordained and when we have this conversation, they almost always ask me, well, how can you, you know, how can you begin to change the culture of a congregation to, to recognize this pattern of dying and rising? And I said, well, I, th I think preaching baptism in this way is really important. And I said, you know, I, I think it would be a really interesting experiment for one year to begin every sermon with the same sentence. It all begins with a death. And, and just see what happens. I mean, we have hundreds of years of Western liturgical history to unravel. So it, it might take that kind of repetition <laughs> um, to get us you know, back on track. I have to say, I've never done that. I, <laughs> I, I just thought it'd be a real cool idea if I was starting my ministry um, all over again. And, and, and that's a really good segue into the next thing I want to talk about, which is, um, you know, how does this idea of, of dying and rising become for you a pattern of life? Mm -hmm. Like, what is it today that God is asking you to die to so that you might be raised up to something new? I'll give you a very, very concrete example of this. Um, and, and we're going to see more of this. I don't, I don't know what things are like where you are, but 
congregations are closing um, out here left and right. Um, they were on the ropes already and COVID just kind of really put them over. Um, but I recently worked with a congregation uh, at the request of our synod um, that was closing. And when all was said and done, um, when they sold their property and paid all their bills and, and they, had, they had considerable debt, their building was not paid for. But when the dust all settled, they had $4 million left. Oh. And um, their constitution was written in a way that that money did not go to the synod. Um, it was theirs to disperse. So they formed a legacy committee and a colleague and I worked with them for almost a year to decide um, what they were going to do with that $4 million. <clears throat> and we decided, my colleague and I decided to approach this task with them baptismally. And so from the very beginning, we talked with them about death, the death of their congregation and new life. <clears throat> How might this four million dollars bring new life in the name of christ and at the end of the day they chose 37 different agencies and institutions to gift with their last will and testament <laughs> in order that those organizations could receive the breath of baptismal life that they felt called by God to offer them. Now, that's a, that's a pretty big example. Uh, most of us don't have $4 million to give away. Um, but, but you might think about that, like how, how in dying to myself, Will Jesus be raised up through me? We have a question. Yes, please. When my father died at his funeral, the, the presiding minister said that death, it, that it's like a person dies, oh, having been born. The first time have you been born, and then you die. It's like we, you came from God, and then you return to God. What do you think of that? I think that's absolutely beautiful. <laughs> Your dad had a very wise pastor, and I, my guess is you've drawn a lot of comfort from that mm -hmm. funeral sermon over the years. Mm -hmm. yes. Is that correct? Yes. Well, I'm one of those people who's afraid of dying, or was afraid of dying. Afraid of the dark, darkness, and, and mm -hmm. that that's an interesting in the in the dark. dark coincidence. I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear what you said. Um, you're afraid of dying. You've always been afraid of the darkness. But... Past tense. Yeah, yeah it was yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, somebody once said in a conversation similar to this conversation, someone once said, um, uh, my, my grandpa took me out fishing one day. And uh, when we were in the boat together, uh, grandpa said to me, you know, the only death you need to be afraid of is the one you've already died in your baptism, right? Oh, my word. Oh. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. So, um, so don't see death as an enemy. Yeah. You, you, Jesus has already overcome that for you. L live your life with joy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never, I've never forgotten that. Yeah. I, I, that. I found that very helpful for my own life. Yeah. 
Well, when I think about death, I think of it as emptiness. Well, I have, um, and and I don't I don't take this lightly at all. And I, I think there are other clergy people in the room, and I think they would probably um, uh, join this chorus. Um, but I have had the incredible privilege of being with tens of people as they died. And my universal, almost universal experience has been that it is very, very clear that they are um, <clears throat> experiencing something that is incredibly beautiful. And they have, through their witness, invited me into an experience where I don't feel as afraid. Mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful for that. What a privilege. Thank you so much. Yeah. I, I want to I make sort of one more kind of global point, and then we can discuss a little bit more. Um, I, I have come to recognize the importance of this baptismal pattern so much um, that as a as a person who still preaches pretty regularly actually um even though i'm retired um i have come to approach scripture and the preaching task in this way so when i come to uh, the texts for any given sunday that i'm privileged to preach upon the first question that i ask myself about those texts is where is the dying and rising in this text where do i see that deep baptismal theology um, embodied in these words i have just a couple of examples for you these these are pretty i would call these low-hanging fruit <laughs> <laughs> these are these are pretty easy ones to see that dying and rising in the first one is from Matthew 16 uh, Jesus told his disciples if any want to become my followers let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me for those who want to save their life will lose it and those who lose their life for my sake will find it I think it's pretty easy to see the dying and the rising in that deny ourselves take up the cross follow John 12, very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. I, is I, raise your hand if you have trouble seeing the dying and rising in that. Uh, one more, uh, this one's a little more obscure, but I think you'll catch on. Uh, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. I think there's two dying and risings in there. First, uh, in a very real sense, God dies to his heavenly self, so he can be, so God can become human and live among us. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes may not perish dying, but have eternal life rising. Uh, now, um, last week's text, remember that about the like the uh, dishonest manager? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, was, I was glad I was playing the organ and not preaching that particular Sunday. I think it's a little harder to dig out the dying and rising in a passage like that, but I think it's there. I think it's there. And, um, I, you know, th this little 
this little um, method of mine one has to be careful about because you don't want to just like um, make something up that isn't there. Um, but I do think if we go deeply enough into scripture, um, that pattern um, is 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 just written on written on every page. That's a huge amount of material. Um, what what are you thinking? What questions do you have? What would you like to hear next week, Paul? Yeah, um, the dishonest manager died to the belief that he could do it himself. He put his trust mm -hmm. elsewhere. And when we die to ourselves, we put our trust in God, then we see new possibilities. In his case, his friends bailed him out. Mm -hmm. But it, it it's a picture of the new creation. Thank you. Did you preach last week, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear that song. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really want you to think this is your homework. Um, I really want you to think in this uh, week to come about how uh, God in Christ through your holy baptism is inviting you into um, a, a dying so that something even more life-giving can be raised up. And I, I don't want you to think about that in terms of um, what you do at church. <laughs> I want you to think about that, please, in terms of like grocery shopping or um, navigating in traffic or being a sibling or a grandparent or a parent. How is it that with hopefully fresh eyes, um, you will you will see the opportunity to live into your baptism more fully in everyday life. I'm, I'm going to ask for um, reports <laughs> from the field <laughs> next week um, when we gather. Uh, well, you promised you'd take us outside and that we could see the Puget Sound right outside. It is pretty beautiful out there right now. Um, when I step onto my deck, I'm not going to say anything because I live in a condo community and it's mm -hmm. Sunday morning in Seattle at 722. So people still are not awake, but then I'll come back in and um, say goodbye to you all. But I need yeah. to leave, but I just want you all to Wait. I want to say to you, are you at all surprised when I first met <laughs> how what his words came into me? Yeah. And I thought, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Oh gosh, you must be that. So the the um for those of you who know anything about Puget Sound, Bill, for example, that the land that you saw on the other side of the water is uh, Whidbey Island. Wow. And um, my wife, Donna, and I just feel very, very blessed to have led, been led to this place by God. Mm -hmm. And um, we just get to be immersed in our baptismal covenant every time we look out the window. So yeah. we, we do feel really, really really, really blessed. And I feel really blessed to have been able to come to you in this odd electronic way today. Um, I've been blessed by your presence in my life. And um, I, I really look forward to 
um, being with you next week when you've had a little time to let all this churn and um, see what we come up with together. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Blessed week, Jean Paul. Blessed week. <laughs>